Speaks is one of the most remarkable works of channeled information in history. It is the product of a process that began when Jane Roberts received what she called her psychic initiation one evening in September 1963 as she sat writing poetry. As she explained it, quote, Suddenly my consciousness left my body and my mind was barraged by ideas that were astonishing and new to me at the time. Unquote. Because of that experience, Miss Roberts and her husband, Robert Butts, started doing research into psychic activity and planning a book. In line with their research, they began experimenting with a Ouija board. After the first few sessions, the pointer spelled out messages that claimed to come from a personality calling himself Seth. As neither Miss Roberts or her husband had any psychic background, they initially presumed that the messages were coming from Miss Roberts' subconscious. However, she soon began to feel compelled to speak these messages aloud, and the Ouija board became redundant as, within a month, she was easily passing into trance and speaking for Seth while in a trance state. Seth communicated in twice-weekly sessions, in the process developing a continuing manuscript that would ultimately total over 6,000 typewritten pages. From those pages, Miss Roberts first compiled a book titled The Seth Material. Then, on January 19, 1970, Seth announced that he would be dictating a book of his own. The dictation began two days later on January 21st and was concluded on August 11, 1971. An appendix was added over the following six weeks. The title that Seth gave to his book was Seth Speaks, The Eternal Validity of the Soul. In it, he discusses a vast range of subjects. In a text that is so voluminous, we cannot hope to reproduce it here in its entirety. Therefore, we have focused on some specific aspects and areas of various key issues. Among them, the identity and multidimensional aspect of the soul. Consciousness. Death and after-death experiences. Dreams. Reincarnation. Christ, his crucifixion, and the second coming the nature of God, and of good and evil, the rise and fall of civilizations that preceded Atlantis, and how a brotherhood of speakers has worked throughout history to preserve the essential knowledge of humankind. The information within this program is challenging, thought-provoking, sometimes controversial. We are sure you'll agree that it is also, in the truest sense of the word, remarkable. What you are about to hear are the words of Seth, as spoken by Jane Roberts and transcribed by her husband, Robert Butts, and narrated on this recording by Scott Turchin. As we begin, Seth speaks about himself, his environment, the nature of reality, and the nature of ourselves. You have heard of ghost hunters. I can quite literally be called a ghost writer, though I do not approve of the term ghost. It is true that I am usually not seen in physical terms. I do not like the word spirit, either. Yet, if your definition of that word implies the idea of a personality without a physical body, then I would have to agree that the description fits me. I address an unseen audience. However, I know that they exist, and therefore I shall ask each of them, now, to grant me the same privilege. I communicate with you through the auspices of a woman of whom I have become quite fond, to others, it seems strange that I address her as Rupert and him, but the fact is that I have known her in other times and places by other names. Names are not important, however. My name is Seth. Names are simply designations, symbols, and yet, since you must use them, I shall also. I write this with the cooperation of Rupert, who speaks the words for me. In this life, Rupert is called Jane, and her husband, Robert Butts, takes down the words that Jane speaks. I call him Joseph. You may suppose that you are physical creatures, bound within physical bodies, imprisoned within bone, flesh, and skin. If you believe that your existence is dependent upon this corporeal image, then you feel in danger of extinction. No physical form lasts, and no body, however beautiful in youth, retains the same vigor and enchantment in old age. If you identify with your own youth, or beauty, or intellect, or accomplishments, then there is the constant gnawing knowledge that these attributes can and will vanish. 
I am speaking to assure you that this is not the case. Basically, you are no more of a physical being than I am, and I have donned and discarded more bodies than I care to tell. I am quite independent of a physical image, and so are you. Consciousness creates form. It is not the other way around. All personalities are not physical. It is only because you are so busily concerned with daily matters that you do not realize that there is a portion of you who knows that its own powers are far superior to those shown by the ordinary self. You have each lived other existences, and that knowledge is within you, though you are not consciously aware of it. I hope that this will serve to release the deeply intuitive self within each of you and to bring to the foreground of consciousness whatever particular insights will serve you most. I speak to those who believe in a God and those who do not, to those who believe that science will find all answers as to the nature of reality, and to those who do not. I hope to give you clues that will enable you to study the nature of reality for yourself as you have never studied it before. There are several things that I shall ask you to understand. You are not stuck in time like a fly in a closed bottle whose wings are therefore useless. You cannot trust your physical senses to give you a true picture of reality. They are lovely liars with such a fantastic tale to tell that you believe it without question. You are sometimes wiser, more creative, and far more knowledgeable when you are dreaming than when you are awake. I am primarily a personality with a message. You create the world that you know. You have been given perhaps the most awesome gift of all, the ability to project your thought outward into physical form. The fact is that each of you creates your own physical reality, and en masse, you create both the glories and the terrors that exist within your earthly experience. Until you realize that you are the creators, you will refuse to accept this responsibility. Consciousness is a way of perceiving the various dimensions of reality. Consciousness as you know it is highly specialized. The physical senses allow you to perceive the three-dimensional world, and yet by their very nature they can inhibit the perception of other equally valid dimensions. Most of you identify with your daily physically oriented self. You do not identify with the inner portion of yourselves. You prefer to identify with the part of you who watches television or cooks or works, the part you think knows what it is doing. But the seemingly unconscious portion of yourself is far more knowledgeable, and upon its smooth functioning your entire physical existence depends. This portion is conscious, aware, alert. I call it the inner ego for it directs inner activities. It correlates information that is perceived not through the physical senses, but through other inner channels. It is the inner perceiver of reality that exists beyond the three-dimensional. It carries within it the memory of each of your past existences. The outer ego and the inner ego operate together, the one to enable you to manipulate in the world that you know, the other to bring you those delicate inner perceptions without which physical existence could not be maintained. There is, however, a portion of you, the deeper identity, who forms both the inner ego and the outer ego, who decided that you would be a physical being in this place and in this time. This is the core of your identity, the psychic seed from which you sprang, the multidimensional personality of which you are part. You cannot understand yourselves, and you cannot accept my independent existence until you rid yourself of the notion that personality is a here-and-now attribute of consciousness. The self that you know is but one fragment of your entire identity. These fragment selves are not strung together, however, like beads on a string. They are more like the various skins of an onion or segments of an orange, all connected through the one vitality and growing out into various realities while springing from the same source. Nothing exists, neither rock, mineral, plant, animal, or air that is not filled with consciousness of its own kind. So you stand amid a constant vital commotion, a gestalt of aware energy, and you are yourselves physically composed of conscious cells that carry within themselves the realization of their own identity, that cooperate willingly to form the corporeal structure that is your physical body. I am saying, of course, that there is no such thing as dead matter. There is no object that was not formed by consciousness, and each consciousness, regardless of its degree, rejoices in sensation and creativity, 
You cannot understand what you are unless you understand such matters. The ego is a jealous god, and it wants its interests served. It does not want to admit the reality of any dimensions except those within which it feels comfortable and can understand. If you have a limited conception of the nature of reality, then your ego will do its best to keep you in the small and closed area of your accepted reality. If, on the other hand, your intuitions and creative instincts are allowed freedom, then they communicate some knowledge of greater dimensions to this most physically oriented portion of your personality. Personality is a gestalt of ever-changing perception. It is the part of the identity which perceives. I do not force my perceptions upon the woman through whom I speak, nor is her consciousness blotted out during our communications. Instead, there is an expansion of her consciousness and a projection of energy that is directed away from three-dimensional reality. This concentration away from the physical system may make it appear as if her consciousness is blotted out. Instead, more is added to it. There is within Rupert's personality a rather unique facility that makes our communications possible. I will try to put this as simply as possible. There is within his psyche what amounts to a transparent dimensional warp that serves almost like an open window through which other realities can be perceived, a multidimensional opening that has to some extent escaped being clouded over by the shade of physical focus. The physical senses usually blind you to these open channels, for they perceive reality only in their own image. To some extent, then, I enter your reality through a psychological warp in your space and time. In a manner of speaking, such an open channel serves much as a pathway between Rupert's personality and my own, so that communication is possible between. My environment now is not the one in which you will find yourself immediately after death. You must die many times before you enter this particular plane of existence. Birth is much more of a shock than death. Sometimes when you die you do not realize it, but birth almost always implies a sharp and sudden recognition. So there is no need to fear death. And I, who have died more times than I care to tell, speak these words to tell you so. In my home environment, I assume whatever shape I please, and it may vary, and does, with the nature of my thoughts. This ability to change form is an inherent characteristic of any consciousness. Only the degree of proficiency and actualization varies. You can see this in your own system, in a slowed-down version, when you observe the changing forms taken by living matter through its evolutionary history. My environment changes constantly, and therefore is composed of exquisite imbalances where change is allowed full play. Your own time structure misleads you into your ideas of the relative permanency of physical matter, and you close your eyes to the constant alterations within it. Your physical senses confine you, as best they can, to the perception of a highly formalized reality. Only through the use of the intuitions, and in sleep and dream states, as a rule, can you perceive the joyfully changing nature of your own and any consciousness. Now, many of these freedoms are quite natural to you in the dream state, and you form dream environments often to exercise such potentials. You can learn to change your physical environment by learning to change and manipulate your dream environment. You can also suggest specific dreams in which a desired change is seen, and under certain conditions, these will then appear in your physical reality. Often, you do this without realizing it. The senses that you use, in a very real manner, create the environment that you perceive. Your physical senses necessitate the perception of a three-dimensional reality. Consciousness is equipped with inner perceptors, however. These are inherent within all consciousness, regardless of its development. Using the inner senses, we become conscious creators, co-creators. But you are unconscious co-creators, whether you know it or not. If our environment seems unstructured to you, it is only because you do not understand the true nature of order, which has nothing to do with permanent form, but only appears to have from your perspective. It is quite true that your physical senses create the reality that they perceive. A tree is something far different to a microbe, a bird, an insect, and a man who stands beneath it. I am not saying that the tree only appears to be different. It is different. You perceive its reality through one set of highly specialized senses, this does not mean that its reality exists in that form in any more basic way than it exists in the form perceived by the microbe, insect, or bird. 
You cannot perceive the quite valid reality of that tree in any context but your own. This applies to anything within the physical system that you know. It is not that physical reality is false. It is that the physical picture is simply one of an infinite number of ways of perceiving the various guises through which consciousness expresses itself. The physical senses force you to translate experience into physical perceptions. The inner senses open your range of perception, allow you to interpret experience in a far freer manner, and to create new forms and new channels through which you, or any consciousness, can know itself. You look out into the physical universe and interpret reality according to the information received from your outer senses. You are fascinated with physical reality, and you are in as deep a trance now as the woman is through whom I write this book. All of your attention is focused in a highly specialized way upon one shining bright point that you call reality. There are other realities all about you, but you ignore their existence, and you blot out all stimuli that come from them. There is a reason for such a trance, as you will discover, but little by little you must wake up. My purpose is to open your inner eyes. Your ideas of space are highly erroneous. In a very real manner, space as you perceive it simply does not exist. Not only is the illusion of space caused by your own physical perceptive mechanisms, but is also caused by mental patterns that you have accepted, patterns that are adopted by consciousness when it reaches a certain stage of evolution within your system. When you arrive or emerge into physical life, not only is your mind not a blank slate, waiting for the scrolls that experience will write upon it, but you are already equipped with a memory bank far surpassing that of any computer. You face your first day upon the planet with skills and abilities already built in, though they may or may not be used, and they are not merely the result of heredity as you think of it. You may think of your soul or entity, though only briefly and for the sake of this analogy, as some conscious and living, divinely inspired computer who programs its own existences and lifetimes. Your planetary systems exist at once, simultaneously, both in time and in space. The universe that you seem to perceive, either visually or through instruments, appears to be composed of galaxies, stars, and planets at various distances from you. Basically, however, this is an illusion. Your senses and your very existence as physical creatures program you to perceive the universe in such a way. The universe, as you know it, is your interpretation of events as they intrude upon your three-dimensional reality. The events are mental. When I enter your system, I move through a series of mental and psychic events. You would interpret these events as space and time, and so, often, I must use these terms, for I must use your language rather than my own. When I enter your environment, I turn my consciousness in your direction. In one way, I translate what I am into an event that you can understand to some extent. In a much more limited manner, any artist does the same thing when he translates what he is, or a portion of it, into a painting. When I enter your system, I intrude into three-dimensional reality. Whether or not you realize it, each of you intrudes into other systems of reality in your dream states without the full participation of your normally conscious self. In subjective experience, you leave behind physical existence and act, at times, with strong purpose and creative validity within dreams that you forget the instant you awaken. When I contact your reality, therefore, it is as if I were entering one of your dreams. I can be aware of myself as I dictate this book through Jane Roberts, and yet also be aware of myself in my own environment. I send only a portion of myself here, as you perhaps send out a portion of your consciousness as you write a letter to a friend, and yet are aware of the room in which you sit. I send out much more than you do in a letter, for a portion of my consciousness is now within the entranced woman as I dictate, but the analogy is close enough. <laughs> And now Seth speaks of the soul and the nature of perception. With a little background given so far, we can begin to discuss the subject of this program, the eternal validity of the soul. Even when we are exploring other issues, we will be trying to illustrate the multidimensional aspect of this inner self. There are many misconceptions connected with it, and first of all, we shall try to dismiss these. 
First of all, a soul is not something that you have. It is what you are. I usually use the term entity in preference to the term soul, simply because its connotations are less religious in an organizational sense. The trouble is that you frequently consider the soul, or entity, as a finished, static thing that belongs to you but is not you. The soul, or entity, in other words, your most intimate, powerful inner identity, is and must be forever changing. It is not, therefore, something like a cherished heirloom. It is alive, responsive, curious. It forms the flesh and the world that you know, and it is in a state of becoming. Often it seems that the soul is thought of as a precious stone to be finally presented as a gift to God or considered as some women used to consider their virginity, something highly prized that must be lost, the losing of it being signified as a fine gift to the receiver. In many philosophies, this sort of idea is retained, the soul being returned to a primal giver or being dissolved in a nebulous state somewhere between being and non-being. The soul is, however, first of all, creative. The soul, or entity, is itself the most highly motivated, most highly energized, and most potent consciousness unit known in any universe. It is energy concentrated to a degree quite unbelievable to you. It contains unlimited potentials, but it must work out its own identity and form its own worlds. It carries within it the burden of all being. Within it are personality potentials beyond your comprehension. Remember, this is your own soul or entity I am speaking of, as well as soul or entity in general. You are one manifestation of your own soul. How many of you would want to limit your reality, your entire reality, to the experience you now know? You do this when you imagine that your present self is your entire personality, or insist that your identity be maintained unchanged through an endless eternity. The soul, above all, perceives and creates. Remember again that you are a soul now. The soul within you, therefore, is now perceiving. Its methods of perception are the same now as they were before your physical birth and as they will be after your physical death. So basically, the inner portion of you, the soul stuff, will not suddenly change its methods of perception nor its characteristics after physical death. You can find out what the soul is now, therefore, it is not something waiting for you at your death, nor is it something you must save or redeem, and it is also something that you cannot lose. The term, to lose or save your soul, has been grossly misinterpreted and distorted, for it is the part of you that is indeed indestructible. Your own personality as you know it, that portion of you that you consider most precious, most uniquely you, will also never be destroyed or lost. It is a portion of the soul. The soul perceives all experience directly. Most experiences of which you are aware come packaged in physical wrapping, and you take the wrapping for the experience itself and do not think of looking inside. The soul, however, does not need to follow the laws and principles that are a part of the physical reality, and it does not depend upon physical perception. The soul's perceptions are of acts and events that are mental, that lie, so to speak, beneath physical events as you know them. The soul's perceptions are not dependent upon time, because time is a physical camouflage and does not apply to non-physical reality. It then follows that some hints of the soul's direct experience can be gained by momentarily switching the physical senses off, by refusing to use them as perceptors, and falling back upon other methods. Now you do this to some extent in the dream state, but even then in many dreams you still tend to translate experience into hallucinatory physical terms. Most of the dreams that you recall are of this nature. At certain depths of sleep, however, the soul's perception operates relatively unhampered. You drink, so to speak, from the pure well of perception. You communicate with the depths of your own being and the source of your creativity. These experiences, not being translated physically, do not remain in the morning. You do not remember them as dreams. The soul can be considered as an electromagnetic energy field of which you are part. It is a field of concentrated action when you consider it in this light, a powerhouse of probabilities or probable actions seeking to be expressed. It is a grouping of non-physical consciousness that nevertheless knows itself as an identity. Look at it this way. 
The young woman through whom I speak once stated in a poem, and I quote, These atoms speak and call themselves my name, unquote. Your physical body is a field of energy with a certain form, however, and when someone asks you your name, your lips speak it. And yet the name does not belong to the atoms and molecules in the lips that utter the syllables. The name has meaning only to you. Within your body you cannot put your finger upon your own identity. If you could travel within your body, you could not find where your identity resides. Yet you say, this is my body, and this is my name. The soul is not frightened for its identity. It is sure of itself. It ever seeks. It is not afraid of being overwhelmed by experience or perception. If you had a more thorough understanding of the nature of identity, you would not, for example, fear telepathy. For behind this concern is the worry that your identity will be swept away by the suggestions or thoughts of others. It seems to you that you have only one form, the physical one that you perceive and no other. It also seems that your form can only be in one place at one time. You have indeed other forms that you do not perceive, and you also create various kinds of forms for various purposes, although you do not perceive these physically either. You are presently focused not only in your physical body, but within a particular frequency of events that you interpret as time. Other historical periods exist simultaneously in forms quite as valid, and other reincarnational selves. Again, you simply are not tuned to those frequencies. You can know what happened in the past and have histories because according to the rules of the game that you accepted, you believe that the past, but not the future, can be perceived. You could have histories of the future and the present if the rules of the game were different. In other levels of reality, the rules of the game change. After death, in your terms, you are quite free perceptively the future appears as clearly as the past. The so-called stream of consciousness is simply that, one small stream of thoughts, images, and impressions, part of a much deeper river of consciousness that represents our own far greater existence and experience. You spend all your time examining this one small stream so that you become hypnotized by its flow and entranced by its motion. Simultaneously, these other streams of perception and consciousness go by without your notice, yet they are very much a part of you. They represent quite valid aspects, events, actions, and emotions with which you are also involved in other layers of reality. You are as actively and vividly concerned in these realities as you are in the one in which your main attention is now focused. Often you tune into these other streams of consciousness without realizing you have done so, for again, they are a part of the same river of your identity. All are therefore connected. Any creative work involves you in a cooperative process in which you learn to dip into these other streams of consciousness. You come up with a perception that has far more dimensions than one arising from the one narrow, usual stream of consciousness that you know. Great creativity is then multidimensional for this reason. Its origin is not from one reality, but from many and it is tinged with the multiplicity of that origin. Great creativity always seems greater than its pure physical dimension and reality. By contrast with the so-called usual, it appears almost as an intrusion. It takes the breath away. Such creativity automatically reminds each man of his own multidimensional reality. The words, know thyself, therefore, mean far more than most people ever suppose. In moments of solitude, you may become aware of some of these other streams of consciousness. These other existences of yours go on quite merrily, whether you are waking or sleeping, but while you are awake, ordinarily you block them out. In the dream state, you are much more aware of them, although there is a final process of dreaming that often masks intense psychological and psychic experience. Unfortunately, what you usually recall is this final dream version, some dreams themselves do take place in psychic or mental areas connected with your daily activities, but in the very deep reaches of sleep experience, those, incidentally, not yet touched upon by scientists in so-called dream laboratories, you are in communication with other portions of your own identity and with the other realities in which they exist.
Some waking states, of course, come very close to sleep states. These blend one into the other so that the rhythm often goes unnoticed. These gradations of consciousness are accompanied by changes in the physical organism. In the more sluggish periods of waking consciousness, there is a lack of concentration, a cutting off of stimuli to varying degrees, an increase in accidents, and generally a lower body tone. Because of your habits of an extended sleep period, followed by an extended waking period, you do not take advantage of these rhythms of consciousness. The high peaks are to some extent smothered, or even go unnoticed. The sharp contrast and the high efficiency of the natural waking consciousness is barely utilized. Two sleep periods of three hours apiece would be quite sufficient for most people if the proper suggestions were given before sleep, suggestions that would ensure the body's complete recuperation. There are many variations, in fact, that would be better than your present system. Ideally, sleeping five hours at a time, you gain the maximum benefit and anything else over this time is not nearly as helpful. Those who require more sleep would then take, say, a two-hour nap. For others, a four-hour sleep session and two naps would be highly beneficial. I am giving you all of this material here because it will help you understand and use your present abilities. You are asking too much of normal waking consciousness, smoothing out the valleys and peaks of its activity, demanding in some cases that it go full blast ahead when it is actually at a minimal period, denying yourself the great mobility of consciousness that is possible. In some cases, you literally force yourself to sleep when your consciousness could be at one of its maximum points. This is, incidentally, in the pre-dawn period. In certain afternoon hours, consciousness is lowered and needs refreshment that is instead denied to it. If the stages of waking consciousness were examined as sleep stages are presently being examined, for example, you would find a much greater range of activity than is suspected. Certain transition stages are completely ignored. In many ways it can be said that consciousness does indeed flicker and varies in intensities. It is not like a steady beam of light. A clear, uncluttered, bright, and powerful consciousness needs frequent rest periods if its efficiency is to be maintained and if it is to correctly interpret reality. Otherwise, it distorts what is perceived. Now, Seth speaks of death and after-death experiences. What happens at the point of death? The question is much more easily asked than answered. Basically, there is not any particular point of death in those terms, even in the case of a sudden accident. I will attempt to give you a practical answer to what you think of as this practical question, however. What the question really means to most people is this. What will happen when I am not alive in physical terms any longer? What will I feel? Will I still be myself? Will the emotions that propelled me in life continue to do so? Is there a heaven or a hell? Will I be greeted by gods or demons, enemies or beloved ones? Most of all, the question means, when I am dead, will I still be who I am now, and will I remember those who are dear to me now? First of all, let us consider the fact just mentioned. There is no separate, indivisible, specific point of death. Life is a state of becoming, and death is a part of this process of becoming. You are alive now, a consciousness knowing itself, sparkling with cognition amid a debris of dead and dying cells, alive while the atoms and molecules of your body die and are reborn. You are alive, therefore, in the midst of small deaths. Portions of your own image crumble away moment by moment and are replaced, and you scarcely give the matter a thought. So you are to some extent alive now in the midst of the death of yourself, alive despite and yet because of the multitudinous deaths and rebirths that occur within your body in physical terms. If the cells did not die and were not replenished, the physical image would not continue to exist. So now in the present, as you know it, your consciousness flickers about your ever-changing corporeal image. In many ways you can compare your consciousness as you know it now to a firefly, for while it seems to you that your consciousness is continuous, this is not so. It also flickers off and on, though it is never completely extinguished. Its focus is not nearly as constant as you suppose, however. 
so as you are alive in the midst of your own multitudinous small deaths, so though you do not realize it, you are often dead, even amid the sparkling life of your own consciousness. There are overall rhythms, and within them an infinity of individual variations, almost like cosmic metabolism. In these terms, what you call death is simply the insertion of a longer duration of that pulsation of which you are not aware, a long pause in that other dimension, so to speak. The death, say, of physical tissue is merely a part of the process of life as you know it in your system, a part of the process of becoming. And from those tissues, as you know, new life will spring. All through your lifetime, portions of your body die, and the body that you have now does not contain one particle of physical matter that it had, say, ten years ago. This process, you see, continues so smoothly that you are not aware of it. The pulses mentioned earlier are so short in duration that your consciousness skips over them merrily, yet your physical perception cannot seem to bridge the gap when the longer rhythm of pulsation occurs. And so, this is the time that you perceive as death. What you want to know, therefore, is what happens when your consciousness is directed away from physical reality, and when momentarily it seems to have no image to wear. You will find yourself in another form, an image that will appear physical to you to a large degree, as long as you do not try to manipulate within the physical system with it. Then the differences between it and the physical body will become obvious. You will simply be learning to operate in a new environment in which different laws apply, and the laws are far less limiting than the physical ones with which you now operate. In other words, you must learn to understand and use new freedoms. Even these experiences will vary, however, and even this state is a state of becoming, for many will continue into other physical lives. Some will exist and develop their abilities in different systems of reality altogether, and so for a time will remain in this intermediary state. For those of you who are lazy, I can offer no hope. Death will not bring you an eternal resting place. You may rest, if this is your wish, for a while. Not only must you use your abilities after death, however, but you must face up to yourself for those that you did not use during your previous existence. Now, when I speak to you, I very seldom use such words as love. I do not tell you that a god is waiting for you on the other side of a golden door. I do not reassure you by telling you that when you are dead, God will be waiting for you in all his majestic mercy, and that that will be the end of your responsibility. However, through traveling within yourselves, you will discover the unity of your consciousness with other consciousnesses. You will discover the multidimensional love and energy that gives consciousness to all things. This will not lead you to want to rest upon the proverbial blessed bosom. It will instead inspire you to take a better hand in the job of creation. That feeling of divine presence you will find indeed and feel indeed, for you will sense it behind the dance of the molecules and in yourselves and in your neighbors. You may or may not be greeted by friends or relatives immediately following death. This is a personal matter, as always. Overall, you may be far more interested in people that you have known in past lives than those close to you in the present one, for example. Your true feeling toward relatives who are also dead will be known to you and to them. There is no hypocrisy. You do not pretend to love a parent who did little to earn your respect or love. Telepathy operates without distortion in this after-death period, so you must deal with the true relationships that exist between yourself and all relatives and friends who await you. You may find that someone you considered merely an enemy actually deserved your love and respect, for example, and you will then treat him accordingly. You examine the fabric of the existence you have left, and you learn to understand how your experiences were the result of your own thoughts and emotions and how these affected others. Until this examination is through, you are not yet aware of the larger portions of your own identity. When you realize the significance and meaning of the life you have just left, then you are ready for conscious knowledge of your other existences. You become aware, then, of an expanded awareness. What you are begins to include what you have been in other lives, and you begin to make plans for your next physical existence, if you decide upon one. You can instead enter another level of reality and then return to a physical existence if you choose. An individual can be so certain that death is the end of all 
that oblivion, though temporary, results. In many cases, immediately on leaving the body, there is, of course, amazement and a recognition of the situation. The body itself may be viewed, for example, and many funerals have a guest of honor amidst the company, and no one gazes into the face of the corpse with as much curiosity and wonder. After leaving the physical body, you will immediately find yourself in another. This is the same kind of form in which you travel in out-of-body projections, and again, let me remind you that each of you leaves your body for some time each night during sleep. This form will seem physical. It will not be seen by those still in the physical body, however, generally speaking. It can do anything that you do now in your dreams. Therefore, it flies, goes through solid objects, and is moved directly by your will, taking you, say, from one location to another. You cannot, as a rule, manipulate physical objects. This body is yours instantly, but it is not the only form that you will have. For that matter, this image is not a new one. It is interwound with your physical body now, but you do not perceive it. Following death, it will be the only body you are aware of for some time. After-death experiences will not seem so alien or incomprehensible if you realize that you encounter similar situations as a normal part of your present existence. In sleep and dream states, you are involved in the same dimension of existence in which you will have your after-death experiences. You do not remember the most important part of these nightly adventures, and so those you do recall seem bizarre or chaotic as a rule. The simple fact is that when you dream you are flying, you often are. In the dream state, you operate under the same conditions, more or less, that are native to a consciousness not focused in physical reality. Many of your experiences, therefore, are precisely those you may meet after death. You may speak with dead friends or relatives, revisit the past, greet old classmates, walk down the streets that existed 50 years earlier in physical time, travel through space without taking any physical time to do so, be met by guides, be instructed, teach others, perform meaningful work, solve problems, hallucinate. As your daily endeavors have meaning and purpose, so do your dream adventures, and in these also you attain various goals of your own. In the dream state you learn, among other things, how to construct your own physical reality day by day, just as after death you learn how to construct your next physical lifetime. After-death environments exist all about you now, period. It is as if your present situation and all its physical phenomena were projected from within yourself outward, giving you a continuous running motion picture, forcing you to perceive only those images that were being transposed. These seem so real that you find yourself in a position of reacting to them constantly. They serve to mask other quite valid realities that exist at the same time, however. It is actually from these other realities that you gain the power and the knowledge to operate the material projections. You can set the machine on idle, so to speak, stop the apparent motion, and turn your attention to these realities. In many ways, then, you are dead now, and as dead as you will ever be. While you go about your daily chores and endeavors, beneath normal waking consciousness, you are constantly focused in other realities also, reacting to stimuli of which your physical conscious self is not aware, perceiving conditions through the inner senses, and experiencing events that are not even registered within the physical brain. After death, you are simply aware of these dimensions of activity that you now ignore. Now, physical existence predominates. Then, it will not. Nor, however, will it be lost to you. Your memories, for example, will be retained. You will simply step out of a particular framework of reference. If you want to know what death is like, then become aware of your own consciousness as it is divorced from physical activities. You will find that it is highly active. With practice, you will discover that your normal waking consciousness is highly limited and that what you thought of once as death conditions seem much more like life conditions. In the same way, in the midst of life, you dwell with so-called ghosts and apparitions, and for that matter, you yourselves appear as apparitions to others. There are obviously as many kinds of ghosts and apparitions as there are people. They are as alert or as unalert to their situation as you are to your own. They are not fully focused in physical reality, however, either in personality or in form, 
and this is their main distinction. If a ghost wants to contact you, he can do so through telepathy. Or the individual might send you a thought form at the same time that he telepathically communicates with you. Your rooms are full now of thought forms that you do not perceive. And again, you are as much a ghostly phenomenon now as you will be after death. You are simply not aware of the fact. You ignore certain temperature variations and stirring of air as imagination that are instead indicative of such thought forms. You thrust into the background telepathic communications that often accompany such forms. You turn aside from all clues that other realities exist quite validly with your own and that in the midst of one existence you are surrounded by intangible but valid evidence. The very words life and death serve to limit your understanding, to set up barriers where none intrinsically exist. Some dead friends and relatives do visit you, projecting from their own level of reality into yours, but you cannot as a rule perceive their forms. They are not more ghostly or dead, however, than you are when you project into their reality, as you do from the sleep state. As a rule, however, they can perceive you on those occasions. What you often forget is that such individuals are in various stages of development. Some have stronger connections to the physical system than others. The length of time an individual has been dead, in your terms, has little to do with whether or not you will be so visited, but rather the intensity of the relationship. In the sleep state, you may help recently dead persons, complete strangers, to acclimate to after-death conditions, even though this knowledge is not available to you in the morning. So others strangers, may communicate with you when you are sleeping and even guide you through various periods of your life. Continuing the subject of life after death, Seth now speaks of reincarnation. There are unlimited varieties of experience open to you after death, all possible, but some less probable than others according to your development. You may decide upon another reincarnation. You may decide to focus instead on your past life, using it as the stuff of new experience, creating variations of events as you have known them, making corrections as you choose. Now some individuals, some personalities, prefer a life organization bound about past, present, and future in a seemingly logical structure, and these persons usually choose reincarnation. Others prefer to experience events in an extraordinarily intuitive manner, with the organization being provided by the associative processes. Some simply find the physical system not to their liking, and in such a way take leave of it. This cannot be done, however, until the reincarnational cycle, once chosen, is completed. The last choice exists for those who have developed their abilities through reincarnation as far as possible within that system. Some, finished with reincarnation, may choose to re-enter the cycle acting as teachers, and in such cases some recognition of higher identity is always present. Now there is an in-between stage of relative indecision, a mid-place of existence, a rest area, comparatively speaking, and it is from this area that most communications from relatives occurs. This is usually the level that is visited by the living in projections from the dream state. Before the time of choosing, however, there is a period of self-examination, and your full history becomes available to you. You understand the nature of the entity, and you are advised by other portions of that entity more advanced than yourself. You will become aware of your other reincarnational selves, for example. There will be emotional ties with other personalities whom you have known in past lives, and some of these may supersede your relationships in the immediately past life. This is a meeting place for individuals from your own system also, however. Conditions and development are important rather than the length an individual stays in this area. It is an intermediary step, but an important one. In your dreams, you have been here. Reincarnation involves far more than a simple decision to undergo another physical existence. In this in-between period of which I am speaking, many issues, therefore, are considered. When most people think of reincarnation, they think in terms of a one-line progression in which the soul perfects itself in each succeeding life. This is a gross simplification. There are endless varieties of this one theme, individual variations. 
The process of reincarnation is used in many ways, therefore, and in this time of rest, individuals must decide on the unique way in which reincarnation will be of use. Some, for example, isolate various characteristics in a given life and work on these almost exclusively, basing a given existence upon, say, one main theme. As seen from a physical viewpoint, such a personality would appear very one-sided and far from a well-developed individual. In one life, the intellect may purposely be very high, and those powers of the mind carried as far as the individual can take them. These abilities are then studied thoroughly by the entire personality, both the benefits and the detrimental aspects of the intellect weighed carefully. Through experience in another life, this same kind of individual might specialize in emotional development and purposely underplay intellectual abilities. Some will choose progression at an easier rate and in a more balanced manner. They will help keep all the strands of personality working at once, so to speak, and even meet again and again people they have known in other lives. They will work out problems at a rather easy rate, rather than in, say, an explosive way. They will pace themselves, as dancers do. The time of choosing is dependent upon the condition and circumstances of the individual, following transition from physical life. Some take longer than others to understand the situation. Others must be divested of many impeding ideas and symbols. The time of choosing may happen almost immediately, in your terms, or it may be put off for a much longer period while training is carried on. The main impediments standing in the way of the time of choosing are, of course, the faulty ideas harbored by any given individual. A belief in heaven or hell under certain conditions can be equally disadvantageous. Some will refuse to accept the idea of further work, development, and challenge, believing instead that conventional heaven situations are the only possibility. For some time they may indeed inhabit such an environment until they learn through their own experience that existence demands development and that such a heaven would be sterile, boring, and indeed deadly. Then they are ready for the time of choosing. Others may insist that because of their transgressions they will be cast into hell, and because of the force of such belief, they may for some time actually encounter such conditions. In either case, however, there are always teachers available. They try to get through these false beliefs. While, generally speaking, the issues just mentioned operate as impediments, there are always exceptions. A belief in heaven that is not an obsessional belief can be used as a useful framework a basis of operation in which an individual will often accept easily the new explanations that will be offered. Even a belief in a time of judgment is a useful framework in many instances, for while there is no punishment meted out in your terms, the individual is then prepared for some kind of spiritual examination and evaluation. Those who understand thoroughly that reality is self-created will have least difficulty those who have learned to understand and operate in the mechanics of the dream state will have great advantage. A belief in demons is highly disadvantageous after death, as it is during physical existence. A systematized theology of opposites is also detrimental. If you believe, for example, that all good must be balanced by evil, then you bind yourself into a system of reality that is highly limiting and that contains within it the seeds of great torment. In such a system, even good becomes suspect because an equal evil is seen to follow it. The God versus devil, angels versus demons, the gulf between animals and angels, all of these distortions are impediments. Quite simply, a belief in the good without a belief in the evil may seem highly unrealistic to you. This belief, however, is the best kind of insurance that you can have, both during physical life and afterward. It may outrage your intellect, and the evidence of your physical senses may shout that it is untrue. Yet a belief in good without a belief in evil is actually highly realistic, since in physical life it will keep your body healthier, keep you psychologically free of many fears and mental difficulties, and bring you a feeling of ease and spontaneity in which the development of your abilities can be better fulfilled. After death it will release you from the belief in demons and hell and enforce punishment, you will be better prepared to understand the nature of reality as it is. Again, I understand that the concept could indeed offend your intellect and that your senses seem to deny it. Yet you should already realize that your senses tell you many things which are not true. 
I tell you that your physical senses perceive a reality that is a result of your beliefs. Believing in evils, you will, of course, perceive them. Your world has not tried the experiment as yet which would release you. Christianity was but a distortion of this main truth, that is, organized Christianity as you know it. I am not simply speaking here of the original precepts. They were hardly given a chance. The experiment that would transform your world would operate upon the basic idea that you create your own reality according to the nature of your beliefs, and that all existence was blessed, and that evil did not exist in it. If these ideas were followed individually and collectively, then the evidence of your physical senses would find no contradiction. They would perceive the world and existence as good. This is the experiment that has not been tried, and these are the truths that you must learn after physical death. Some, after death, understanding these truths, choose to return to physical existence and explain them. Through the centuries, this has been the way. Now, these descriptions of after-death events may sound very complicated, particularly if you have been used to a simple tale of heaven or eternal rest. Unfortunately, the words fail to describe many of the basics that I would have you understand. There is no such simple end to the life that you know, such as the story of heaven. There is the freedom to understand your own reality, to develop your abilities further, and to feel more deeply the nature of your own existence as a part of all that is. Throughout your reincarnational existences, you expand your consciousness, your ideas, your perceptions, your values. You break away from self-adopted restrictions, and you grow spiritually as you learn to step aside from limiting conceptions and dogmas. From within your point of reference, it is often difficult for you to perceive that all events work toward creativity, or to trust in the spontaneous creativity of your own natures. Within your system, to kill is obviously a moral crime, but to kill another in punishment only compounds the original error. Someone very well known who established a church, if you will, a civilization, once said, Turn the other cheek if you are attacked. The original meaning of that remark, however, should be understood. You should turn the other cheek because you realize that basically the attacker only attacks himself. Thank you.